Kiora, hello. Um, my name is John Bradbury. I work in the people experience practice here at the EMA. And um, in this episode of the EMA cast, uh, I'm really pleased to have with me uh, Professor Jared Ha. Um, and Jared has recently published a, a paper on perceived discrimination in the workplace in New Zealand. And I was very interested when I, I saw the article and I thought it'd be great to get Jared to come in and tell us a bit more about the article. So, um, Jared, do, do you want to tell us a little bit perhaps about yourself and what led to this article? <laughs> yeah, kia ora there, John. Um, so, ko tanui te waka, ko Nati Mani Apoto me Nati Mahuta na iwi, ko Jared Hau Toko Ingawa. Um, so I've been doing lots of employee research, and this is kind of one of those interesting ones. I, I, one of my kind of major, I guess, HR themes is looking at Māori employees and their work experiences. And I was at a Ngāpai o Te Maramatanga, which is the, the Māori Centre for uh, Research Excellence. And in a conversation, somebody said, ah, oh, the only trouble with always focusing on the positives are if, if there are negatives um, – in the workplace experience, which is obviously what I capture, and, and we don't kind of publish those stories, then people don't know about them. And I said, oh, actually, it's funny you should say that. I do have this data on uh, discrimination in the workplace. And they said, well, that's a good example. You know, I encourage you to, to do something with that. And so I kind of went back and got motivated to kind of write that, that article up. So that's kind of where that came from, not my traditional area. And I'd never written anything in this area before, but it has turned out to be... Um, academically popular, or albeit mainly because the results are so terrible, but um, no doubt we'll talk about those. Well, yeah, I suppose maybe give, give us a highlight in terms of in terms of the results and and what particularly s- stood out for you in those results. Yeah, so so it's looking at perceived discrimination, so that you know being treated differently, basically, and and you know, woman talk about this, you know, you know, sexist behavior in the workplace, being treated differently because you're a, you're a woman. And, and this one is looking around ethnicity. Um, I did combine Pacifica employees and Maori employees because there was no real difference, unfortunately. They're both bad. Their, their work experiences are. Um, so basically what we found was that does perceive a discrimination occur around ethnicity? It does. It certainly occurs... Um, at quite high levels comparable to kind of research out of the U.S. Um, In particular in the U.S., believe it or not, they focus a lot on Latinos as their kind of, um, I guess, the, you know, group of interests rather than African Americans, which is what I I would have naturally thought. Um, And our levels appear to be, you know, quite a bit higher on average for both Māori and Pacifica. There was no difference between those two groups. And fundamentally... Uh, and no real surprise, but if you're if you're experiencing more discrimination at work, you're you're less likely to like your job. You're less engaged, um, and you experience more job stress. So those kind of three things were pretty modest um, modest effects statistically, uh, and and obviously disappointing. But the real surprise for me was the effects on mental health for mm. Maori and Pacifica. Was there was a huge effect from workplace discrimination on job anxiety and job depression. So basically, I'm getting no joy from the job. I get no excitement from the job. Um, and those things are really impacted heavily by discriminative, um, discriminatory uh, experiences in the workplace. OK, so that sounds a bit of a downward spiral, I guess, in terms of people's mental health and therefore their job satisfaction, their work outputs and, and so forth. Just just take me back a step. Um, you talk about it as, as perceived discrimination. So h- how do you kind of define and quantify and measure? Yeah, yeah. so there is a so there's a kind of 10 item scale mm. on this thing and the, and the psychometric properties were, were all good. It, it did make sense. Um, the most the two most frequent ones, and they are more frequent than than all the rest, were about you know racist jokes being made, uh, and the other one is about negative stereotypes, um, you know, but, you know, and and being applied to the worker. So you know, oh, you know, Ma- Maori academics don't do this so much, um, and so I'm thinking, oh, thanks very much. That would be you know, if we applied it to my own. Um, work experience there. So those are more of the type of things, but other ones where, you know, I'm discouraged to use 
um, my language, for example, which is kind of interesting because we have a Te Reo Māori week here in Aotearoa, and there still is, you know, that, and that was one of the the those who use their um, indigenous language more. So that's Māori and and your Pacifica, which of course is obviously a whole host of different languages there. But if you're using that more in the workplace, you are more likely to be discriminated against. So clearly targeting, you know, put, painting a, a target on yourself, which of course did, did, <laughs> did make me actually quite upset because I was thinking, gosh, you've got all these things to try to encourage um, the use of language in the workplace. Um, you know, Tongan, uh, you know, language week and things like that. And, and still that's going to actually perpetrate a, a negative effect on, on, on a lot of workers in so, the workplace. So you're say, what you're saying there is that this is about people using their indigenous language in the workplace. By using it, that, that in some way... Uh, affects the amount of discrimination yeah. that they receive. Yeah, so if I if I go around and I'm always, Kiora, John, yeah. you know, Talofa, uh, and people go, oh, you, you know, and then that's when the stereotypes might come in, right? So oh, you, you know what? You use that indigenous language so often, I, I think it's because you don't speak very good English. And it's just like, what are you talking about? You know, and that's someone having a, applying that kind of stereotype to Māori and Pacifica in the workplace. Right. So I imagine that would be quite distressing and disabling to somebody to, to feel that they couldn't speak in their indigenous language in, in, in New Zealand. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, especially when we have these yeah. kind of um, events where we're, we're promoting it and things like that. Um, and so, so that's just kind of, I guess, one of those markers, right? Yes. You, you're you're signalling that, oh, you know, oh, I'm I'm interested in my Pacifica culture or my uh, Maori culture, and and that's a kind of, you know, you then I would suggest the data would say become a bit of a target for being uh, discriminated against. Yeah, and you know, in in, in this research, did did you look at uh, you know what the sort of composition of the workforce was, or you know, for the for the individual and the work environment in terms of uh, was the person perhaps isolated, or were there other people um, in in the same situation as them? Yeah. So yeah, there's a, there's a lot. There. So the the sample is quite representative of um, of the New Zealand workforce. Mm. It's like 585. Uh, and and the ma- majority, the dominant group is Maori in that yeah. in that sample, four four hundred and thirty five, forty five, something like that. Um, so there is a good healthy number. They're very mm. much well spread across uh, public sector, private sector, not for profit. There's no difference on mm. those experiences where you work. Um, you know, which which again talks about the universal nature of discrimination, I guess. Yeah. Um, and I guess one of the other interesting things to me. You know, it, it is all bad, but but it was finding that higher educated Maori and Pacifica were more likely to be discriminated against than you know. So so university degree and higher were more discriminated against than um, you know those with only a high school qualification or, or a polytech one. Right, that's really fascinating. Um, why, why, why do you think that happens? Why is it that? Yeah, yeah. well, I mean, it might be that we've now got. You know, we've got a growing, I guess, skilled workforce, yes. Maori and Pacifica, maybe in, in, in higher positions. And that kind of triggers the, you know, let's be honest, it's a, it's a racist yeah. reaction, right? And that's probably triggering that, oh, why is that person in that position? You know, they shouldn't really have that job. Um, and I, I think it's just another one of those things. It was kind of interesting, though, that it wasn't low-skilled yes. workforces. Yes. Now, I have to quantify that because um, – the actual sample was like for Maori was something like ninety ninety three point nine percent experienced some form of discrimination. Right. And it was slightly higher for Pacifica at like ninety five point something. So really, everybody is getting targeted. Those the the more frequency though comes from higher educated people. Okay. Um, so it's not like oh, if, I, if you're low skilled, you just slip under the radar, and you know you'll still get some attention. Unfortunately. Okay, so you're not seeing difference in what you said earlier is you're not seeing difference across sector, but this difference in terms of where people sit in the organisation hierarchy, that, that was a, perhaps a surprising. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, it, it, it just shows that high education isn't a, isn't a protective element to this thing. And, it, and indeed, it might be the opposite. It might draw more attention to you. And, and one yeah. of the things I've done in, in other research around like so um, minority pay differences and things like that is that a lot of people say, oh, you know, I, I can't see it, I can't be it, uh, and we have a lack of 
um, you know, Māori or Pacifica leaders in the organisation. Yes. And, and so I guess those with higher education, when they're getting to some of those levels, now some people are, are, are obviously using that as a target to strike back. Um, all of which, of course, doesn't doesn't make for a great work experience for for a growing segment of our society that will continue to grow because the birth rates are so much higher. Oh, absolutely. And it's a disincentive to want to rise up the organisation if the experience is that it actually gets worse as you, yeah, as you rise yeah. higher. Yeah, I mean, and, and, and it's the, you know, the, you know, the effects on, say, job satisfaction mm. are quite... Um, moderate and, and by moderate it's, mm. it is bad right but if I've got lots of work and I've got a bad manager it's probably all lumps together <laughs> and it's just another thing about why I don't like my job but the mental health one does really kind of worry me because that's a huge amount and, I, and while we've known about racism in, in New Zealand in, in society in general we really hasn't been much research on the on employees in the workforce and that's kind of the first you know first empirical study of some decency um, and then just to see how frequent it is I'm just kind of like wow that's really disappointing and one of the things I'll do in the future is try to uncover how people might better manage and cope with those kind of stresses and strains but it's clearly a, a critical one I would suggest to mental health especially. Gotcha so yeah so th- if a Maori or a Pacific Islander in, in the workforce, the likelihood is you have experienced discrimination in, in the workplace seems to be what you're saying. You're saying that that will negatively impact that person's mental health. Yeah. And you've talked there about sort of one avenue that you might go down in the future is sort of helping people to better navigate that as individuals. But what about actually from the other side? What, what can organisations do to be more supportive, to uh, prevent this happening in their organisation? Yeah, and I think that's really the key here. Mm-hmm. Um, and definitely one, you know, another avenue I'll be mm-hmm. researching as well. And, and to be honest, I'd much prefer to say, <laughs> you know, here are what organisations should be doing rather than mm-hmm. here's how you need to cope with it. You know, I shouldn't be experiencing these kind of um, you know, it's not like I'm putting these pressures on myself and I'm, and I'm yeah. struggling to cope with the pressures. I'm actually being, you know, verbally assaulted in the workplace, so to speak. So, so clearly organisations yes. play a key role here. Mm. Um, you know, who are more likely to expect, you know, toxic organisations are going to be way more likely to have this kind of behaviour and just see it as a natural part of... Um, of the workplace, which is, I mean, and I'm doing some research on toxic organisations, thankfully not particularly um, common, like maybe 20% mm. kind of get to some kind of level where we might think, oh, okay, that's, that's uncomfortable. And so that actually brought me a bit of comfort. But, um, you know, organisations that show support to, to employee well-beings, they're less likely to have an environment where employees get, um, you know, I guess there's that discrimination, at least on a frequency level. But there, you know, when we've got less than 5% who have no experience, and the, the actual survey question is, in the last week, have you experienced right. <laughs> any of these things? Um, and I look at that and I think, wow, the last week. So it's not like, hey, in the last year. Right? And so some of the bullying stuff, for example, yep. says, have you had this? In the, think of the last year. Well. Wow. I've, str- I've struggled to remember the last couple of months, right? But maybe if you're being bullied, you would say, oh, I remember it. Um, but this one's just the last week, and we've got this kind of, you know, 5 to 6% saying, no, I haven't had any of this. You can see why I, I kind of laugh. When I was doing that part of the paper, I was just like, holy moly, this is um, frightening. And and to be honest, that's been the biggest reaction whenever I... I talked about the paper and that the results, people have just said, well, those percentages, percentages are so high um, and I need to be aware of how we do this. So, you know, clearly managers, well, organisations create the culture, but it'll be through their leaders, right? Managers, leaders st- trying to stamp out those kind of behaviours in the workplace. It's clearly got to be the best way um, to kind of manage those behaviours. And it's just the same as sexist behaviours, um, you know, and you, you know, you think back a few decades and, and we would have had a slightly different take on those things. So I think we can improve. I'm, I'm definitely not suggesting we've eliminated sexism in the in the workplace. But um, at this level, so, and that was my kind of major focus with the paper is to get a baseline. Uh, I certainly, certainly wasn't expecting to be in the kind of 90 percent. Uh, if it had been 50 percent, I think I would have been a bit disappointed. But when I was doing the analysis, I was just, oh my gosh, that's so bad. Um, 
But you know, maybe it, maybe it becomes something else we can add to the list of things we need to be working on in the workplace. Oh, oh definitely. I think um, you know those those figures. Um, and I hadn't really appreciated the, the question was about in the last week because you start to wonder, well, how far would you have to push it back to get to 100 percent? I mean, on that basis, maybe if you'd said two weeks or, or three weeks, which, which is quite frightening, and quite, quite worrying because of the effects for, at the individual level and the effects for the business uh, uh, of people. Um, but you mentioned um, one 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 difference around um, so it seemed to be around education and how high people were in the organisation. And just now you talked about sort of sexist beha- behaviour as well. So w- was there any difference uh, based based on gender around around this? So no gender difference in the Pacific group. I did look at these ones yes. together and separately because just in case there was a difference, mm. um, Maori males were more likely to be to report more frequent discrimination than Māori females, which I was kind of like, oh, okay, that's an interesting um, male thing. Uh, you know, I don't know what the statistics are on because uh, language was one of those mm. factors as well. And I and I don't know whether it was, um, you know, maybe more males are speaking te reo, so that might be a signal there. The other thing that was interesting on a structural level is that micro firms, so those with 10 or less um employees were less likely, so Māori working in those, and, and Pacifica working in those organisations, less likely to experience discrimination. And here, of course, is probably just the reality, right? I've got a manager and there's eight of us working for you. And if you're a good manager and you go, oh, hey, we, what, what, what's with that, Joe? That's not very appropriate. Straight away it gets shut down, right? Because we're in a small unit um, and it's probably those slightly bigger places and it was just anything above that had no difference. So whether you're 20 employees, 50 employees or 2,000, there was no difference. Um, so maybe those smaller units remind us the power of the manager or the leader to, to stamp out those behaviours. And I, you know, I don't want to blame leaders. Um, some of those will be leaders, of course, leading those behaviours. But you know, a lot of it will be work, play, you know, work individuals, co-workers. And maybe they just think they're having a bit of a, a laugh and just, oh, you know, don't take it so seriously. Well, you know, and we know what happens when we start making fun of, um, yeah. you know, white males, for example. And, and you know, and everybody realises that it's not nice to be pigeonholed and and grouped under everybody um and so i think we just got to learn a bit a lot more tolerance around those things and just realizing that there's probably lots of things we can make fun of but people's you know gender their gender identity and their ethnicity is is, aren't you know these are not things that we actually you know it's not water off a duck's back it's acid on a on a duck's back right it's burning through people and i think that's the key to get across to people is these things really hurt. You know, they're hurting up here. That's that's the big thing, and hurting in there. So right. So maybe people not realising how much it was hurt, hurt, or maybe just that thing that you hear. Oh, it's just a joke. It's just a bit of banter. And yeah. actually realising that maybe that's not good enough uh, yeah. to say. Um, and I'm intrigued. You talked about <clears throat> sort of micro firms, you know, and it's like, OK, so, you know, if the firm is sort of 10, 10 or less and it's, it's less prevalent and maybe there's some sort of, uh, I don't know, protective factors there in the sense of people knowing each other. Well, how do you kind of one of the things I'm interested in is how you take that into a larger o- organisation? You know, how do you? Uh, sort of maintain that sort of equilibrium or maintain that positivity yeah. in, in larger organisations? So, so uh, let's be let's be mindful of our tight economic times. So I'm not going to suggest <laughs> get in some training around. You know, I think we need to, you know, let's keep it basic. The, you know, racism in the workplace is highly prevalent. If, you, if you're a CEO or an HR director or HR manager and you think, oh, it's not happening in my workplace, Statistically, that could be true, but it's probably it probably can't. But you know, you're probably wrong. <laughs> You've um, got the five percent that it didn't yeah, happen you know, to in the last week. And, and maybe the, you know, maybe yeah. your organisation yeah. is that five percent. Probably not. And my, one of those things is maybe to reiterate: Hey, look, yes. this recent research has come out. This is really damaging, especially to mental health. We're really trying to care for people. Um, you know, this we we need to watch what we're saying. We you know we need to to you know remove those kind of jokes mm. um, you know and and you know and maybe if you're going to say a joke just replay that in your head with you as the as the um the butt of the, the butt joke of and, and yeah. see what you think of that one and if you go oh uh, you know and if you think oh i wouldn't mind well good you said about yourself then 
um, you know, because then maybe that is funny. And if everybody laughs at you, um, you know, fair enough. But, yeah. you know, we're, we're, not, we're not all comedians. And I, and I think some of that stuff probably is quite just having a bit of fun. But knowing that it's hurting um, and, and then kind of so at that organisation level, reminding leaders to, to, you know, distill that down through the organisation, through their, you know, if you've got a team leader or something like that, just getting them to say, hey, look, you know, we're going to try to, to stamp out. I mean, and I wouldn't say stamp out racist uh, comments. You know, let, let's get rid of it all, right? And let's get rid of the sexism. Let's get rid of the racism. Let's get rid of the genderism because that seems to be quite a hot topic as well. Um, one thing I should say is my master's student, we did something on this on Muslims in New Zealand, a, a much smaller group, but found kind of the same terrible effects uh, and, and, and frequency it was surprisingly high. So, you know, the data would suggest Maori Pacifica Muslims, um, you know, if anybody who's different is, is likely to be a target. Um, and I think, you know, that's just, it's just something that's not, you know, we, I would love to think we're, we're beyond that in the 21st century. Uh, obviously not, but maybe something for managers, for owners to be more cognizant of and me, you know, yes. reward. I always like saying that, you know, use those KPIs to reward uh, managers stamping out on that stuff. Oh, I've disciplined a, wow, that's great, right? Because now you're signaling to your team that we can't tolerate this stuff. You know, maybe it's just a, a verbal warning when it comes up and says, hey, look, that, you know, yes. next time I'll bring HR in here and we'll make it official. Oh, I was only having fun. Yeah, but this is not the kind of fun that everybody here appreciates. And yeah. that's, I think that's the bit, right? We need to just remind people that if that's the only thing you can have a laugh on, then maybe your sense of humor needs adjustment. Right. Okay. <laughs> so, I mean, there's, 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 there's a, this is part of leadership around. Yeah, I mean, clearly there's a kind of self-leadership on it about people thinking about their own behaviour in, in relation to this and, you know, perhaps haven't thought of the consequences in the past. Um, but as, as a leader in an organisation, I'm, I'm really interested in not, not just sort of, I suppose, sanctions, but also what, what you can do as a leader to paint a, a sort of positive culture. And I was really interested in your paper you mentioned a concept of servant leadership and we we spoke to uh kim kim herrick who's worked on diversity inclusion belonging at kiwi rail and she talked about that concept as well um but so i just wonder can you just explain that concept a bit and, yeah, and what so, it would mean in this context so i've looked at servant leadership and mm. in, in a lot of my maori mm. studies actually you know so servant leadership is when your style is about you you're there to serve people it's not to be I'm the I'm you know I'm the all power, uh, and you're my subordinate. It's actually about trying to lift you up, uh, get the best out of your workers by by making them the best they can be. And if they, heaven forbid, they became more skilled than you and moved above you, then you should actually be saying, well, that's good, right? That's that that would be a genuine servant leadership. And and I think that style resonates particularly well with minority groups, whether it's Maori or Pacifica or woman, right? Because, you know, you're really saying, hey, I'm here to support you. And one of those things with that kind of style would be, you know, trying to clamp down anything that's, um, you know, detrimental or distressing to pe people. And that doesn't mean we can't have a, a laugh about something. But, but at some stage, you know, it's just about, I guess, you know, signaling to the team that, hey, these are topics that we just don't appreciate because we have, you know, we've got women in the team, we've got Maori and Pacifica here, you know, those those kind of minority targeted jokes um, aren't funny to them. So let's, you know, we, you, you know, you just need to improve and and you know, talk about something more, you know, something more mundane. <laughs> but you know, there's, you can go on YouTube and there'd be a million comedy jokes to rip off, yeah. um, especially those dad jokes, right? They're just ridiculously yep. bland. Yep. But funny, so there, there's something you could you could do that won't offend anybody. Very good. Yes, um, I do get some feedback on my dad jokes at home, so but I won't <laughs> try it any here. Um, so um, you know, servant leadership is is sort of sort of a concept people could be thinking of in terms of the way in which they they, they manage people. Um, I mean, I, I want to go back to something you mentioned earlier about about language and the way in which. Uh, people might be targeted for using m m so-called minority languages in, in, in the workplace. 
Um, you know, you talked at that point about where we, we do things like Maori Language Week, Tonga Language Week and, and, and so forth. Um, I know organisations like, like the EMA itself, we, we've had a uh, uh, session of education around learning te reo and so forth. What, what place do things like that have in, um, you know, reducing perceived discrimination yeah, and yeah. its effects? I, I, that's a great question. I do think, you know, the more we normalise languages, mm. especially diverse languages, I mean, te reo was, the, you know, Māori, other tanga te whena were of New Zealand. So that that's... That's well, actually, in Maori language is uh, an official language yes. in New Zealand, right? So, really, what we're trying to do is encourage as many people as possible, and maybe that's a, a good way to, um, you know, bring down some of those barriers around language use and, and just make it a norm all the time. And and if somebody's saying to a manager, you know, oh, I don't want to use that language, then you know, maybe that's a good point for the manager to take that person aside and say. You know, of all things to get you upset about, this one kind of worries me because it's rather innocuous. And, and, you know, and if it is a racist thing, then it might be saying, hey, look, you know, this isn't the greatest place for you to be working because we, we want to use more of this. And, um, you know, and, and ironically, in other work I've done, other research uh, non for the whole workforce, including a large sample of Pākehā, they, they actually benefited from working in an organisation that used more Maori language, for example, they, they actually liked their jobs more, thought it was a more, <laughs> you know, inclusive organisation because they're doing it. So there's some there's some interesting. Uh, All right. So so it's the, so uh, encouraging things like uh, use of Toreo in the in the workplace. Um, it, it has a, has a benefit not just in in sort of mitigating uh, negative comments about it, but actually makes everyone yeah. feel, feel better, you're yeah. saying? Yeah, it's going to make everybody feel better. Because yeah. if you think, you know, especially in the New Zealand context, mm. right, we're thinking, oh, okay, this is this is the norm. Um, I mean, clearly there are people out there who yeah. don't want that to be the, the norm um, and are fighting against it. And one of the ways mm. they're doing mm. it is through that kind of, you know, workplace racism. But, but you know, fundamentally, there's lots of decent people in New Zealand, yes. that's for sure. Lots of decent workplaces, just reminding those employers in particular to say, you know, actually, there's added benefits, right? If, we, if you know, maybe it's an encouragement for non-Māori to, to use language more themselves, right? To, to make it a norm so people... You know, can't say, you know, oh, you're using, you know, your tarot is pretty bad. Yeah, yeah, so is the CEO. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. I won't tell the CEO that, right, because now now I'm going to draw attention to myself. Um, and so I think it's just about, that's one way to, yeah. to normalize. I still think, you know, having leaders to say, hey, let's set some appropriate boundaries here. Um, you know, and I think back, you know, 30 years ago, you'd go into a mechanic shop, right? And they'd always have inappropriate pictures on the wall yes. because that was, I don't know what it was. That was just what the culture was like. You know, we have progressed a lot from there. Um, and maybe, you know, my, my thought of this being a benchmark, you know, maybe every couple of years I'll, I'll tune back in to see if, <laughs> if I don't see that number <laughs> dropping back down again, um, which yeah. would be nice. But... Yeah, I, I think it is something that we've just got to kind of add it to the list, unfortunately. But, yeah. you know, sexism, racism, bullying, we've still got those kind yes. of issues going on and realise that, you know, our workplaces, you know, maybe they need a bit more of a firmer hand on, on what's acceptable. And, and maybe, that you know, throwing that back to leaders and managers and owners to say, hey, this is not what we want to do here because I want to get the best out of my yeah. workers, right? If someone's going to be massively affected with their mental health, they're going to take time off. You know, they're not going to be giving your, you, the employer, the best work they can all the time. Well, particularly at the moment where, um, you know, we are, all know organisations are, are planning to grow and in, uh, recruit more staff. And we know that there aren't more staff out there. So you definitely want to retain the people that you have, retain the talented people you have. Definitely want to be attractive to, um, particularly to growing populations. Um, that being able to present yourself in a, in, a, in a positive way and ensure that that is the experience when people come into the organisation um, is, is, is going to be very, very important. I'd say probably more important uh, than ever. There's yeah. a, probably an economic yeah. and business reason for doing this as well as what we might call a kind of ethical or moral reason for, for doing yeah. it. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, it is all in intertwined mm. in my mm. and some other published research Mm. Um, just on New Zealand firms, but you know yes. that the actual role of retaining talent and attracting talent were as equal as as you know your you know your ability to be um, 
innovative and, and entrepreneurial regarding how, you know, the, the new kind of uh, creations from your organisation, your the innovativeness of New Zealand firms. So definitely that's a key one. Uh, staff that feel discriminated against. Even though I didn't look at turnover in that paper, I, uh, yeah. I have other data that says yes. You know, that, it, it's a driver out of the organisation, right? No one says, "Oh, I'm being discriminated against," but I'm going to stay here and see it out. They'll just say, "Hey," in this labour yes. market, still where it's still relatively uh, tight. You know, they'll just say, "Hey, I'm going I'm to go elsewhere." It probably won't say, "Well, I'm going because I've been treated so no. poorly." Just say, "Oh no, a better opportunities come along." Go, um, you know, and I had that from somebody on LinkedIn, uh, a Pacific person saying, hey, my experiences is if I work in, in, in small Pacifica companies, they're really quite cool because they really get me. And I said to them, you know, well, that, that should be a competitive advantage for Pacifica companies, you know, g- great, you know. Definitely. Go and work in them. <laughs> I, I encourage you if, if you've done it previously and you're getting something out of it. And that's, a, you know, and that'll be the challenge, especially those big corporates who go, you know, oh, I can't seem to get any good Māori in Pacifica. Yes, because they've been, they've been captured by their own organisations who might yes. respect those cultural differences a heck of a lot more. Um, and again, that's what that inclusion is all about, right? Yeah. We want to be, we want to belong, but we want to be unique, yes. right? Yeah. I mean, and, and we want you to be un- unique um, with your differences as as my differences as her differences and, and that's what it should be about and I think what this exposes is in the New Zealand in the, in the a large sh- you know cut of the New Zealand workplace is perhaps not doing so well around <laughs> ethnic differences at the moment so right and and for you um, you know when you reflect on the paper you know absolute key things for you that, that come out of it in terms of what organizations need to do now. yeah and well I think one of those things is realize that way yeah. more likely that it's occurring than yes. not you know, 90, <laughs> you, know <laughs> you could be in the five percent. Um, yeah, but that might be. But this yeah. week going on, somebody just, just drops the wrong comment, and now now you are in that group. So I guess it's about setting good benchmarks. I mean, and I don't mean write a policy that has a yeah. hundred bullet points. You know, tell every manager to tell everybody down the line that, hey, you know, the research shows that there is lots of this behaviour going on. Can we at least work hard on removing, um, you know, ethnic jokes? ethnic stereotypes from the workplace because there there are other things on there and those two were by far the most common and prevalent um and would probably go a long way because if no one's making a joke all of a sudden i don't feel so different right because i feel like oh, i'm just i am part of the whole team and maybe when i you know i say oh you know i'll have a go doing the karakia for this important meeting you know, your white colleague who doesn't speak any today, you know, gives you a hard time and goes, oh, that, oh, that wasn't very good. Should be saying, oh, good on you for doing that. I'm, that, that makes me nervous. And uh, and if they're a new today speaker, they'll say, yeah, me too, right? <laughs> That's even more pressure on me being Māori because I want to get it right. Oh, I didn't think of it that way. Um, so it's all just about trying to break down those barriers. So it sounds like there's... It's a number of smaller things, a number of sort of particular actions on an individual basis, this encouragement around language I hear a lot um, about sort of stamping down uh, on what's not acceptable and being really kind of clear on that. Um, And you sound as if um, your focus would be very much on doing the, the practical things rather than writing a policy and documents on it. Would that yeah, be? Well, I, and I, because I'm, I'm trying to be mindful to your, your audience who would say, oh, gosh, I don't want to write another, you know, section 15.4.1, no use of, you know. So, so yeah, I mean, and let's yes. keep it simple, right? I mean, and what I would say is, though, you know, don't say, you know, let's get rid of jokes and stereotypes around ethnic differences because what it should be about differences in general, right? Stay away from, from women's stereotypes. Stay away from the ethnic stereotypes. Stay away from the whole, you know, LGBTQI things, right? Because there's, you know, to, in today's society, there, there's, no, there's no punchline there. There's no funny, there's nothing you can really say. Leave that for the comedians to do in their shows and, and and a lot of them get roasted for it and a lot of them say bring it on <laughs> yes. but you know but they're, they're a different profile once we start making those kind of comments in the workplace we, we are going back in time right we're going back 30 yes. years 
and I think we ha- we we are, we are improving, even though that data tells us we've still got more work to do. So just keep it simple, I think, and you know, and maybe one of those things is to if you're going to add a add something on it, add a KPI to your managers to say, are you, you know, are you stamping, are you paying attention and trying to stamp out this kind of behaviour? Because that's one way that managers might go, oh, okay, I I will. I won't be, you know, I'll say, hey, look, the organization just doesn't like those things. I'm stamping it out here. And then they can, maybe they'll add that to their (laughs) performance appraisal. Sure. So I think your paper, you know, to me, you might couch it more carefully than this, but it sort of says to me something like, you know, this um, racism, uh, discrimination is alive in your workplace, whether you're noticing it or not. It's it's happening and it's having a negative consequence for people. And if we kind of go, okay, so that's that's where we are now. And the number of ideas on, on how to counter that, make it a better workplace where people bring their better selves to work and give their best um, for you sort of I, I would guess it, it set you up in a number of directions of things I want to research more things I want to look at more what, what would they <laughs> yeah. be Jared? yeah well that's <laughs> that's the that's the interesting challenge right I think one of those things is trying to break down you know where where this occurs more mm. often now the the mm. trouble with 95 percent <laughs> coverage is there's very little place to hide uh, yes. in there um but, but that's okay. That's a, that's a starting point. And I think my next paper will be looking at, you know, leadership and organizational yes. drivers. Because if one thing you can say, hey, organizations that do these kind of things better have, have, have workers experiencing this less. Okay, that's something to inspire for, for at the organization level things. But, but my next research is actually going to look at um, this kind of perceived discrimination and bullying and, and probably sexism as well. Um, Partly because I'm, I'm just interested in how much these overlap, but also how much they're all driving down mental health, for example. Um, and it might be that they're driving up turnover. And then mm. if you're interested in keeping your workers, you might go, "She's it's... But, if, but we go back to what's the solutions? The solutions are the same, though, right? <laughs> Those are the type of behaviours. Yes. Hey, I, I heard what you were saying to that person. You can't speak to somebody that way. Oh, I was just trying to motivate them. Hey, she sounded like a bully to me. Oh, you know, and no yeah. one likes being called out, but maybe that's a good reminder. Good managers will call things out, right? And the best manager will be the one saying, I haven't had to call out anything for six months because I did it all six months yeah, ago. Yeah, they've set the standard. And they've set, set that, the tone that now. That tone, yeah, yes, yeah. Um, yes. Oh, very interesting. Fascinating sort of sort of area and a very important area, I think, um, you know, on an individual basis, an organisational basis, and also, you know, for our wider communities and our, our kind of wider well-being. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of focus at the moment around mental health uh, initiatives. Um, you know, I think that's become more recognised since, since yes. COVID and, and so forth. Um, you know, within your mental health I- initiatives, how could how could you best sort of incorporate into addressing sort of perceived discrimination? Well, I guess one of those things is getting people to acknowledge that, yeah, I have mm. been received, because that might be a useful mechanism for managers to go, oh my gosh, I got, I'm in charge of 20 people mm-hmm. and I've got, you know, the half who are woman or an ethnic minority have all told me that, yeah, I've had this in the last week. I mean, while that's terrible, I would suggest it probably reflects the data. Um, and that gives you a starting point to work on as a, as a manager, right? You'd have to say, ah, this is, yeah. wasn't what I was hoping for, <laughs> unless it, it's probably what reality is. But but once we're aware of something, you know, we, we will address something that we we have some focus on. And if we pretend it doesn't exist Perhaps you'll never you'll never be surprised and say, "Oh no, I've never had that problem." You know, y- yes, you have. You're just choosing to ignore it. Um, but again, you know, going back to the wider circle, if we look after our workers, they'll perform better. They'll stay. Well, we all want workers <laughs> to perform better, um, and in this super tight labour market, we surely want people to to stay. And so, I think that whole kind of uh, inclusion approach around belonging and uniqueness, and realizing that the uniqueness is is certainly way more complex than it was 30 years ago um but that's just the the reality of our our of society now and and you know you be on the front foot and and embrace the embrace the <laughs> diversity uh, because it'll benefit everybody fantastic and sort of a sort of final question um 
you know, in terms of this research, what's what's the reaction that you've had to the research? Yeah, so it's been um, well, it's been amazingly positive, albeit <laughs> that people have been very depressed by the results. But right. I've, I've I've never had so much out, outreach from. Uh, non-academics, lots of Māori, lots of Pacifica say, oh, I'd like to read that because that's reflecting my reality. Stink, yeah. but I'm glad I've yeah, captured yeah, yeah. your voice. But I've had lots of CEOs, which is kind of different. Often I'll get the HR managers, but I've had them, but plus CEOs saying, I need to really get a better understanding of this. And I think a lot of it is one thing I've been, you know, 93.9% because that just scares everybody, right? They go like, yeah. bugger, that's so high. Well, there's no ambiguity about that. Yeah. There's no, yeah. well, maybe, maybe not. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that's very interesting, the groups that you mentioned that have come to you. I, I guess for some people there, it would be, you know, good to go, okay, this this, this is my, my reality. You know, it's not me. Mm. This this is this is what's happening. So I think that's interesting in terms of the response from Maori and, and, and Pacific Islanders. I think um, also... It's very heartening if you're getting CEOs asking about yes. this. It shows that it's on their agenda, that it's on their mind, that they want to make a difference in their organisation. And, and you know, HR practitioners looking at it too would, would suggest, again, that they're, they're aware that they need to do something. I guess exactly as you were talking about just now, about how do you retain your people, how do you get them to work their best in your organisation. So... Um, well, you know, I think that's a very interesting kind of note to kind of think about ending this on. Is there any last sort of points you want to make or do you feel that uh, we've no, no, got a good sense? Yeah, I think we've covered it nicely. I mean, you know, it's clearly a negative and it will remain a negative if you don't do something about it. So I guess my thing is to say if you're doing anything, you know, if you're paying some attention to this, then you'll be on that front foot of trying to make your workplaces better. Um, and again, if it's better for everybody who's there... It'll be, you know, it'll be good for the organisation. It really is as simple as that. And I think this tells us that we have a, a big group Great. Um, who are struggling. Um, and let's throw it back to managers to help to help change their workplaces. Great. That's fantastic. I think that's a nice, straightforward, practical kind of call to action, isn't it? So, I mean, thank you so much for... Um, well, sharing the bad news with us, and I, I think that it's a very it's a very serious topic and a very important one. And I thank you for taking us through it so so uh, comprehensively. Um, obviously, in terms of these uh, podcasts, we, we continue to explore uh, sort of new thinking um, around HR issues, people experience issues in in New Zealand organisations, and we're always interested to hear. Um, you know, what people's experience has been and, and whether your experience matches uh, what we, we talk about in these podcasts. So I'd like to thank everyone very much for listening to today's uh, uh, podcast with uh, Professor Jared Ha. Thank you all very much.